Welcome to the Acts class. We are looking this quarter at spiritual leadership in the books of 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles. But if you're uh, following the quarterly, you know that our editors are taking us on a detour this week to the book of Isaiah for the study of what may be the most famous call to leadership that we see in the scripture. Uh, there are a lot of calls to leadership in the scripture, and, and one thing that strikes me is how different they all are. God is not locked into a single pattern here. So Moses got a burning bush, but David didn't. David was picked out of a lineup by a man of God. Um, uh, Ezekiel saw a divine light show in the heavens. Um, Gideon didn't. But Gideon got a visit from the angel of the Lord, which almost certainly is the pre-incarnate Christ. Samuel, we talked about him uh, just uh, a week or so ago. Samuel heard a voice in the middle of the night. That was his call. Paul got knocked off his horse on the road to Damascus and blinded temporarily uh, by an appearance of the Lord Jesus to call him into service. And Isaiah... The call that we're looking at today, Isaiah was called as he worshiped. An unforgettable moment, because in that moment, he saw the Lord, he said, and he saw himself, and he saw his purpose in life. So let's look at this passage in that context. First of all, Isaiah saw the Lord. It was in the year 740 B.C. We know that because he dates it. It's the year of King Uzziah's death. Uzziah had ruled Judah for 52 years. 52 years. 52 years ago for us was 1972. If you could wrap your mind around this. 1972 was an election year. Richard Nixon was reelected in a landslide over George McGovern in 1972. To understand the span of Isaiah's reign, imagine Richard Nixon being president from that day to this, from 72 to 2024. That would mean no presidential terms for Ford or Carter or Reagan, or Bush number one, or Clinton, or Bush number two, or Obama, or Trump, or Biden. 52 years, that's nine of our presidents, nine out of the 45 presidents in the history of the United States, that we would have missed, for good or ill, we would have missed over that span of 52 years. And I know uh, Biden is number 46, but that's because uh, Grover Cleveland served two non-consecutive terms, so he gets counted twice in there. But 52 years. Can you imagine being under the same leader from 1972 to the present? That's what Judah experienced, in a sense, under the leadership of Uzziah. At first, that sounds like a good thing, because he got off to a very good start. Um, he was a model king at first. Might have been on his way to being one of the greatest, but unfortunately, he began to think of himself in those terms, too. Have you ever noticed the temptation to do that? When people tell you how great you are, you start to believe it. And he became proud. He became arrogant. He became disobedient. I, I've never been a national leader. I guess that must be an occupational hazard, one that I'll never have to worry about. But we all have to worry about pride or arrogance in our own sphere of influence in life, and it brought Isaiah down. He insisted on offering sacrifices himself toward the end of his reign, and that's a privilege God had preserved for the priests. And he knew that but he did it anyway. One possible reason 
is that many of the surrounding kings in his era were also the spiritual leaders of their national religion at the time. And maybe he felt that was something he should be as well, in spite of the fact that God had decreed otherwise. Maybe he was trying to burnish his own international reputation, but he paid a price for it. Isaiah was stricken with leprosy and put in isolation, not in a leper colony, not when you're the king, but in a suite of rooms in the palace, no admission to anybody else, while his son Jotham, uh, who became his co-ruler, sat on the throne. Jotham was the visible symbol of power, but everybody knew who was calling the shots. It was still Isaiah behind the scenes. So, even though he had been out of the public eye for a full decade because of that, the year that King Isaiah died was a crisis year for the people of Judah because of the length of his leadership and because of the, the extent of his influence. Uh, his reign was largely marked by peace and prosperity. Now he's dead. Will that continue? Will the nation continue to prosper? What will happen in this crisis year? <clears throat> the year that King, Uz King Uzziah died, Isaiah said, I saw the Lord. Uh, we know crisis years, don't we? I mean, just looking back in our own history, uh, from, from the crash of 29 to Pearl Harbor in 41 to 9-11, in 2001, we know the effect a crisis year can have. A year, a year that's so marked by a tragedy that it becomes a label for that year. This was the year that King Uzziah died. In uh, Isaiah's ministry, it certainly was a momentous year. It's the year he saw the Lord. Our text begins in Isaiah 6, verse 1. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. In this vision of Isaiah, the temple itself was shaken. The force of their song shook it to its foundation. Uh, the book of Acts records a prayer meeting in chapter 4, and Luke writes that uh, the place where they were meeting was shaken. Same kind of thing. Wouldn't you like to be in a prayer meeting like that? Where the building shakes with the power of God. Isaiah's vision rocked his world. And it would rock ours too. He saw God on his throne. King of Judah may be dead, the ruler of the universe is not. Isaiah was saying, in the year the king died, I saw the king. Capital K. No equal for majesty, no equal for splendor. Isaiah, or Isaiah sorry, is, is in the, the difficult position of having to describe to us something there are no words for. And he does the best he can. He says... Uh, even the train of his robe filled the temple. Uh, John records a vision in, in Revelation chapter 1, a vision of Jesus. Uh, it's, it sounds similar in many ways. Even mentions his robe there as well, uh, swirling about his feet. If, if you have a vision like that, surely you're never the same. 
afterwards. And that's not to say we can't be who God called us to be unless we have a vision like that, but what a blessing it is to catch a glimpse, just a glimpse of who he is. I have to think there is for all of us that window of opportunity somehow, some way, in some measure. Not to the degree, perhaps, of Isaiah 6, not to the degree of Revelation 1, but in ways that can be life-changing for you and me. Um, for, for a worship experience to go that deeply into our soul is something that is life-changing. Uh, I found it interesting. Isaiah's description is so much about the surrounding uh, aspects of the vision as opposed to literally uh, his experience of God himself for which there are no words and and in in a sense we we don't even know to what extent God himself revealed himself remember that passage in Exodus about no one can see God and live Moses saw his back as he passed by we we don't know exactly what Isaiah saw but most of what he tells us is the peripheral aspect of the vision. He, he mentions the Ark of the Covenant, um, symbolic of the throne of God, uh, because the angels that he mentions are praising God. There are angels on the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant, bracketing that lid of the Ark of the Covenant. They're not seraphim, as Isaiah 6 describes. This is the only place seraphim are mentioned in the scripture. But they are cherubim, another rank of angels as well. Their song, holy, 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 they sang back and forth to each other, Isaiah says. It, antiphonal singing was um, a mark of worship in Israel and Judah in biblical days. Um, uh, sing and response, call and response kind of music. And the triple repetition of holy, holy, holy is a way of expressing a superlative. There is no one more holy than he. We sing holy, holy, holy too, don't we? And our hymn is modeled on the language of Isaiah 6. And we sing, cherubim and seraphim fall down before thee, which wert and art and evermore shall be. Uh, I'm glad there's no restriction on Christian music in our lives, but if I had to choose a dozen hymns, Holy 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 would be one of them. If I, if I were limited to some, I'd make sure it's inside that limitation. Uh, it's a beautiful picture of worship, in other words. Uh, in scripture, worship is both reverence and praise. Uh, it's not either or. It's both and. We see them in different aspects and in different ways of expression throughout the scripture. Uh, but worship is both. Uh, this is a classic text on reverence or adoration. Others are focusing on praise or celebration in our worship. But when we see Isaiah's call, he brings us into, by his powerful description and by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he brings us into the moment. And we can experience, to a degree, on a personal level, adoration, reverence before God. And yet, in the passage as we're describing it so far, uh, we haven't met Isaiah's call. We're just seeing Isaiah's vision with him. We're just putting ourselves in the setting in which God will speak. Isaiah saw the Lord. The second thing that happened that day was he saw himself. I, I think this is like part two of the vision, in a sense. Verse five, woe to me, I cried, I'm ruined. I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Woe to me, 
Isaiah says. If we back up a chapter into Isaiah 5, let me just read you a few excerpts. Woe to you who add house to house and join field to field. In other words, those of you who are all about acquisition and wealth. Woe to those who rise early in the morning to run after their drinks, who stay up late at night till they're inflamed with wine. Woe to those who draw sin along like uh, with cords of deceit and wickedness as with cart ropes. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Woe to those who acquit the guilty for a bribe but deny justice to the innocent. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes. If you were counting, that's six. Six woes to the people of Judah for their sins. But wait a minute. When we see lists like that in scripture, it's almost always in a seven, right? Because seven's the number of fullness or completion in scripture. Where's woe number seven? <clears throat> woe number seven's in Isaiah's chapter. Woe number seven's in Isaiah six. Isaiah himself said, woe to me. He clearly saw the sins of his people. He's looking now at the sin that he's responsible for. He saw their hearts, now he's seeing his heart. And God is revealing to him his need, which is priority number one before addressing the needs of others. Woe to me. I had a student one semester who was writing on this verse and he said, um, before Isaiah began his ministry, he had to say, woe. And he spelled it W-H-O-A. <laughs> I started to let him have it. And then I realized, you know, he's not all wrong. <laughs> Something's got to stop before something starts. And Isaiah said, woe to me, W-O-E. He also is saying W-H-O-A. <laughs> woe, woe to the way I've been going. Woe to some of the thoughts I've had. Woe to the, maybe the drifting spirituality that I need to let the Lord correct. Woe to me. It's a very personal kind of prayer. Uh, we know what it's like to have to put the brakes on something for spiritual purposes. And Isaiah understands that too. I'm really struck here by Isaiah's humility in the context of Isaiah's pride. This is in the year King Isaiah died. King Isaiah now infamous for his arrogance. But Isaiah prostrate before the Lord in his humility. Woe to me. I'm not only among a people of unclean lips, I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm not only among a needy people, I'm a needy person. Lord, start with me. God understood that, but he came to meet Isaiah's need. Verse 6, Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. There's another temple detail there. Now, he talked about the surroundings of the temple, and he mentioned the various aspects of it. Uh, here, he's talking about a coal from the altar. This kneeling rail, we call an altar. But you know, in scripture, the original altar is a place of sacrifice, of burnt sacrifice, hence the live coal from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips. You're a person of unclean lips. I can do something about that. This has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. Remember, this is a vision. But in church history, centuries ago, there was a man who announced that he was the new Isaiah, and to prove it, he had someone bring a live coal and touch it to his lips. He didn't speak for several weeks <laughs> after that. The live coal is a symbol, okay? Uh, but it's a powerful symbol of, of cleansing, purging. This is not fire as punishment. This is fire as refining 
and purifying and cleansing, purging impurity, leaving purity in its place. Isaiah knew that the Lord who forgave his sin could forgive the sins of the people he was calling him to. First steps first. And that prepared him for what happened next because the third thing Isaiah sees is he sees his purpose in life. He sees his calling. Verse 8, one of the most famous verses in all the Old Testament. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. Back in Genesis, God said, Let us make man in our own image. The plurals. All through the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for God, Elohim, is a plural form. Even in the Shema, the creed of Israel, which is about monotheism, that's the, that's the point of the creed. Hear, H-E-A-R, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The Lord our God, God is in a plural form. The Lord our God, in a plural form, the Lord is one. And now here, in this famous passage, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Now, there are multiple explanations of that. Some think this is the plural of majesty, as when Queen Victoria said, perhaps very often, I am not, we are not amused. She said, we are not amused. It's the plural of majesty. If so, wouldn't God have said, whom shall we send and who will go for us? Why is there the intentional disparity between singular and plural? Not disparity, just uh, uh, implied contrast. Whom shall I send who will go for us? Some say he was speaking to his heavenly courtiers, the angels, uh, who will go for us, all of the heavenly inhabitants into the world and preach the truth. Maybe. That doesn't explain the Genesis reference because when he said, uh, let us make man in our own image, he wasn't talking about angels. We're not creating the image of angels. We're creating the image of God. I, I think there's another possibility here. I think it's a reference in the Old Testament to what becomes clear in the New Testament that God is a trinity. That in one God, there are three persons. This is heaven's math. We can't, we can't grasp it. We accept it. Um, I've, I've heard a lot of explanations or of, of analogies for or ways to explain the Trinity. They don't work. It's beyond explanation. It's grasped by faith that our God is three in one. And in his majesty, now Isaiah understands his call. Back to that verse, whom shall I send who will go for us? Here is a man named Isaiah, but it's not the Isaiah yet that we are so familiar with. Isaiah, perhaps the most familiar of all the prophets to us in many ways. The one who gave us the greatest prophecies of the coming of the Messiah and the greatest prophecies of the atoning death of the Messiah. This, that, that's this Isaiah, it is for us, this Isaiah is the one whose words in chapter 61 would be chosen by the Messiah himself as the text for his own inaugural sermon in his hometown synagogue in Nazareth as he began his ministry. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me. Text came straight out of Isaiah. That's the Isaiah that we know. The Isaiah who would become chaplain of the court of one of Judah's greatest kings, Josiah. The Isaiah who would be sawn in half, history tells us, while he was still living as a martyr for his faith. But when God is speaking to him in chapter 6, those things haven't happened yet. Not just his martyrdom, his life, his ministry, his prophecy is still in the future as God calls him to be that person that he needs. So who does God see? God sees potential. God sees willingness, brokenness, humility, openness, and God can always use that. 
always. Uh, there's not an Isaiah among us, but we aren't called to be Isaiah. We're called to be who we are, empowered by the Holy Spirit and touched by the God who touched Isaiah. We're not to be him, we're to be us, but we're to be transformed us. We're to be people who are different because vision or no vision, we've met the same Lord Isaiah met in one way or another, and he has changed us as well. This vision precedes all those accomplishments of Isaiah. This vision lays the foundation for all those accomplishments of Isaiah later on. Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Isaiah says, here am I, send me. Imagine an army officer asking for a volunteer. Uh, my understanding is if you're in the military, you don't volunteer. <laughs> uh, as a general rule, it's, 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 it's kind of a dangerous thing to do. I need a volunteer. And so a brash young man steps up and says, I'll volunteer, sir. Do you want me to represent you at divisional headquarters? No. Do you want me to escort the brass when they come to visit our camp? No. Actually, I'm planning a suicide mission, and I really want to thank you. I have to want to thank you for stepping forward. When God said, whom shall I send, he didn't say it's going to be a safe trip. He didn't say there will be no hurdles. He said, I have a job to do. Who's willing to do it? And Isaiah said, here am I. Send me. His commitment level seems to me it was a 10 on a scale of 10. Whatever it is, Lord, I don't know the assignment yet. Am, am I reading this right? I don't know the assignment yet. You want to send somebody to do something? I'm your man. You just tell me what it is. You think that maybe, just maybe, when he was writing those prophecies about the Messiah later on. Maybe when he was giving spiritual counsel to King Josiah. Maybe when he was facing his own martyrdom, what he was remembering was this moment. The surrender moment. The moment where he said, I signed on for whatever. And this is the whatever. Your call and mine won't be as awesome as his, I'm sure. But I do think Isaiah's call, I think our editors are right. I think it can serve as kind of a prototype. Not that we will have the same experience he had, but that we need to have the same sense of surrender that he had. And I wonder if, although your call and my call won't look like Isaiah 6 to us, maybe it looks like Isaiah 6 to God. Maybe it looks this way in heaven, even though it doesn't on earth. A um, famous investor once said, know the history behind your investment before you commit to its future. Well, that's good Wall Street advice, I guess. Know the history behind your investment before you commit to its future. But it strikes me that it's not just Wall Street. It's your street and my street if we're talking about a spiritual investment. What's the history? If God says to us, I need someone, will you be that one? I don't think the next words out of our mouth should be, that depends. Tell me what I'm supposed to do. I think the next words out of our mouth should be, here am I, send me. And then we find out what it is. Pre-committed to follow the will of God. Because we know the history of our investment. We read it in scripture. We know it in our own lives. He's always faithful. And we know the future of our investment. It's eternal. And it's beyond description. If the cost is high, then the cost is high. But for those who say, here am I, send me, the returns are incomparable. And just as Isaiah could not describe the full extent of the vision that he had, there's no way that you and I will be able to describe in any sense the full reward of a surrendered life. Let's pray together. 
Lord, we're so grateful for the way that your word speaks to us in so many different ways. In this case, through an account so long ago that happened to someone and yet rings so true with us here today. We are so grateful. We're so grateful that you would call us to be your servants. We're so grateful that you would trust us with assignments in your kingdom, uh, no matter how large or small those assignments are. They have eternal value. And we're so grateful that we don't serve you on our own strength, in our own strength, but that the one who calls us is the one who enables us. The one who calls us is the one who gifts us. The one who calls us is the one who walks through that lifetime of service with us, shoulder to shoulder, without whose support we could not do what we're called to do. Lord, we are grateful. Thank you for this story from Isaiah. Thank you most of all for our own stories. In Jesus' name, amen.